I'm Doc Issues from Capes on the Couch, a show that examines the mental health issues of comic book characters, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other amazing geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 273 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we focus on your audience by helping to define it. In this week's Better Podcasting Download, we wade into the river side FM updates. And finally, in this week's Better Pod Back, we discuss everyone's podcast changes since Better Podcasting episode 272. Lauren, start the show now. We're happy to be back. This is Better Podcasting. We are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. You've reached episode 273 of Better Podcasting. I am Steven, and of course, my fantastic podcast co-host, SP, is here. I am. It's April 2023. We are proud to be back. Happy to be back. This is what we wait all year for is another episode of Better Podcasting. Yes. And hey, if you didn't know this, we do this show in seasons, which means this is season three of Better Podcasting. Now, we'll introduce the season in a bit here. But before we get into the the first segment we've got up on deck here, I wanted to start off discussing a bit of what you can expect for Better Podcasting and our associated uh, Better Podcasting live chat show for the rest of the year. The summary is that we're making a little changes to the initial plan that we had put out with Better Podcasting, which you might have heard us talk over on live chat about. But the summary is that this show, Better Podcasting Main Show, is going to have season three run April and May, if you are watching this in real time or, or listening to this in real time. And the, the season three finale recording, if you're one of the people who check us out live at geeks.live when we record... It's scheduled to be on May 31st with a uh, release date of June 4th. And then Better Podcasting Live Chat will return for season three the following week, which should be June 7th, uh, releasing June 11th. And that's going to run June, July, August. There will be some gaps in there over the summer while SP and I very much enjoy different uh, summer activities, which are a part. You know, he's got it in his contract. He must spend a minimum, a minimum amount of time away from me each year. So that's going to run June, July, and August. And then the Better Podcasting Main Show will close out the year, coming back for season four in September, running through to the end of November. And uh, SP, you had a great idea about taking December off. And that's one of the things that we adjusted because it's a solid idea. Yeah, we're going to try it out this year. Definitely going to take the bulk of the holiday season off this year. It's just too much of a burden on us and our families. So we're going to take that off. And also statistically podcast listening starts to taper off the last few weeks of the year. So while we still would love to be podcasting, we are just going to take some time off to focus on ourselves and the family and the season for a change and not overburden ourselves because it is just proven over the last few years that it is indeed a burden and it's not fair to our audience because I get behind in my editing, for example, and they don't get the podcast for weeks afterwards. So we're just going to take the time off. We're going to take the hit and then we're going to come back in the new year. And oh, by the way, Stephen, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. If you happen to be watching the video side of the house, you might see that my beard is gone. I know there's a lot of our listeners that pay close attention to me and my beard. Never fear. In season four in October, SP's beard will return. So you can wait until season four for that to happen. <laughs> That's a heck of a, a tease. You know, people might check out of the whole season three of Better Podcasting and Better Podcasting live chat on the video side just because they want to wait for the beard. You, That's what you might have done right there, SP. Well, I got to take the hit somewhere. I mean, allergies versus the beard. Allergies win. <laughs> so it's just how things are going. Now, we mentioned this in the finale of the season two, uh, Better at Podcasting episode, where we're planning on coming back with some of these segments. And so let's go ahead and dust off the How I Save My Podcast story. Here's 
is another How I Saved My Podcast story. Of course, we're going to do it first. We're going to be the one that brings the back the, the uh, story back, which is going to come in the form of me forgetting to hit record. A couple weeks ago on the Better Podcasting live chat show, I was trying something out called OBS Vertical. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And in the process of doing this, I forgot to actually hit record on the video side of things. So what this meant was that I did not have a widescreen version of this show, you know, the normal version of this show, recorded on my computer. And I, I was kind of stuck because I did not have another way to capture that other than where we had streamed out to. So we've talked in the past about how it's beneficial to be streaming out if you are somewhere that is doing video, even if it's to a private video, like on YouTube or something like that, where it's going to be recording there as a backup. And I think we've actually shared a very similar story to this before where I forgot to hit record or SP forgot to hit record or something like that. Uh, it's me. I, I'm the only one that hits record on this show uh, as far as the video goes. So I clearly, clearly forgot to hit record in the previous story. So I, of course, had the option of going to my typical source of going to YouTube and downloading it. But we also streamed out to Twitch. And uh, in my process of looking at this, uh, I grabbed actually both versions because I was able to find that I could download a video version, the thing that I had streamed from Twitch, which was a better quality video than YouTube. In the past, when this has come up, we, we've often streamed out to YouTube and I've been able to just grab the download from there. But YouTube's video is only 720. Meanwhile, Twitch was at the full 1080 that I do stream in and the quality was noticeably better. Now, why I wanted to specifically bring this up is obviously that's how I saved my podcast was, was going and downloading the video from there. But I wanted to bring out, up the idea of being able to pick and choose different video formats depending on where you stream to. Um, but also the idea that there is some differences between software and in my particular case, when we came back with Better Podcasting this year, I or last year, I guess it was, I started to use OBS as the video streaming platform, which is um, something that that a lot of people have access to uh, because it's free and a lot of people choose to use it because it's free. But previous to this, I was using something called XSplit. Well, in XSplit, there is um, something that I've had enabled on there for a very long time where as soon as I hit stream, it actually will go and start recording locally to my hard drive with what I am streaming. So actually, I, I backing up a little bit, if I have had this issue come up before, I still usually had something to, to grab from, which was the lower quality stream, but still on my local computer. But in this case here, I didn't have this enabled because I guess by default, that's not enabled by OBS if the setting's there at all. So I need to have a look and see because... I really like the idea of when you are streaming somewhere or you've got a connection open, you know, an automatic r recording happening. In the past on the audio side of things, when back when people were using Skype, some people had Skype recorder installed and had it set where as soon as they started a Skype call, it would record. And that way you always had some form of backup. And so for me on the video side of things, I want to look into this a little bit more because I like the idea where as soon as I start streaming, it might record a local copy. And I honestly don't know if that's possible in OBS. This was something that recently came up and I haven't had a chance to do any investigation, but I was just glad that I had the uh, Twitch and the YouTube to fall back for. And by the way, I did download both right away because I figured if something happened to be wrong with one, at least I had the other. And I didn't want to take a chance that all of a sudden there'd be a takedown and I couldn't get it anymore. So I made sure to wait until as, as soon as it was available and I grabbed it right away, which is something I would encourage if you're going to go to a back, backup, grab it right away because you never know if all of a sudden one of these platforms delist your video for you know, a false copyright flag or whatever, you, you might not be able to get it. So that's how I save my podcast. But with the note there, I need to look to see how I can better save my podcast or be more reliable with saving my podcast the next time I don't hit record. One thing I've ran into in the past with YouTube is that it takes a while to become available to download. Sometimes when I stream, specifically when I'm using StreamYard, It'll keep that file for 12 hours and won't be able to download for 12 hours. So I'm wondering from your aspect, if you downloaded it now, would it be 
greater than 720? Would it have rendered at like 1080 or 4K or whatever higher resolution you streamed at? So we'll take a look at that. We'll get back with everybody next time. So if you have a story about how you saved your podcast, we'd love to know uh, what happened, what went wrong, how you fixed it. And this is not just I had a backup necessarily. Obviously, today's was because that was the story I wanted to share to branch off to those other things. But there could be something where maybe you started, you you had planned to have a guest on your show and they backed up or they stood you up or you recorded a show and the, it, it did not go well. So you had to tackle that from a different perspective and you wanted to throw away the recording or something like that. The idea about the How I Save My Podcast story segment is that if you've had something go wrong, you can share with our audience how you fixed it and kind of get those creative juices flowing for the audience so that if they're ever in the predicament, they can maybe take a moment to reflect on your story and go, it's okay, maybe I can work through this and find a solution or at least figure out a creative way to handle it. Indeed. So should we go ahead and talk about our audience? We should. We should talk about our audience in front of our audience. Ooh. We're back with another season of Better Podcasting. If you're checking us out for the first time or missed the announcement last season, we decided to start doing an overarching theme for each season. The last season was your personal influence on your podcast. This season, we had a few different topics we wanted to discuss. And when we looked at them in general, we decided the theme was right in front of our eyes. This season, we're going to talk all about audience considerations, particularly podcasting for your audience. So where do we start with a topic like this? Well, first you need to know what your audience is. And today, we're going to discuss defining your audience. So let's start with an important question. Who is your audience? Who do you picture in your mind when you talk into the microphone? Is there a particular type of listener? Remember, it's not necessarily who your audience currently is, but who you're hoping to be reaching. Now, there are some reasons it's important to define your audience. You can shape your podcast to help maximize the enjoyment for that type of listener. You can keep focused and on track with the main themes. You can't deviate too far away from what your main audience would want to hear. It helps when you're making choices about your podcast. Uh, for example, if you're doing a sci-fi podcast with primarily an audience that is dedicated to Star Trek audience, they're called Trekkies or Trekkers, you may lean more towards discussing the latest Trek news rather than scattering across all sci-fi. And not to get too geeky here, but if you're talking to a bunch of Trekkers and Trekkies, there is a certain portion of that audience that doesn't want to hear anything about Star Wars. There happens to be this rivalry between the two. There are people that like both, but there are people that are staunchly in one camp or the other. So you might not want to talk about it at all because you don't want to offend a major part of your audience. I said it was going to be a little ge bit geeky, and it was, but it's an example. Defining your audience can help you determine if you're being successful. Now, if your audience turns out to be somebody else, it's an audience full of people that you aren't trying to attract, you might want to take a look at what you're doing to attract those other folks, and you're not reaching your target audience. So you can look at it as problem solving. And then when promoting your podcast, it helps where your audience might be. If you want to find them virtually, if you want to find them in real life, and ultimately you want to create a relationship with your audience, particularly with a hobby podcast, and knowing who your audience are will help you form that bond together. Now, in today's episode, we want to talk about the idea of really niching down for your podcast and the idea of figuring out the niche you want to reach. So how are you going to determine that niche? Well, let's go back to where we all started with this podcast, Better Podcasting. Back in episode one, we talked about the topic. 
And we're going to assume by this point in considering your audience that you've actually chosen a topic for your podcast. Hey, if you haven't yet, take the time to do that first. So ask yourself, who's going to find the most enjoyment out of this topic? This will at least kind of get you in that ballpark of defining your target audience. Here's an example of why it won't get you all the way, though. Let's say someone is making a podcast where they're trying new cooking and they're going to talk about some experiences trying out new cooking. Well, that narrows it down to people who have an interest in cooking, but cooking is really a broad topic. So there may be people who enjoy one type of cuisine, but not another. Perhaps if you want to niche down on your audience, you want to pick a specific type of cooking. Maybe you want to target audience of people who enjoy Canadian cooking. This is going to help you choose dishes that you're going to try that center around meats and syrup and all sorts of beaver tails and things like that. Or maybe it's more Minnesotan cooking, which centers mostly around casseroles, various fruit-infused jello molds, and loot fisk and heavy dairy products. Don't get me started on the dairy products. But no, not now in these examples, if you really define that style of cuisine, you're actually going to have a very focused target. Okay, a serious note. You might have a certain theme like being uh, a North American that's going to try non-North American dishes. This is going to really target your audience towards people who are willing to step outside of their comfort and try something new. If you don't define that up front, you might find yourself with too large of an audience in that example, and you might be trying to appease too many different types of literal tastes when it comes to cooking. Which kind of brings us to one of the disadvantages to not defining your target audience. Because if you don't define your target audience, you might find it harder to actually appease your audience. In this cooking example, you're helping limit the scope of what you're going to discuss down to the idea of non-North American dishes. This also will limit to what you're going to review and try to make and review on your podcast in this example. Now, additionally, defining your niche audience can help you shape the content for your show. Now, let's dig into our tried and true woodshed and dust off our trusty woodworking podcast example. Let's say you have a woodworking podcast that targets people who are getting into woodworking. What can you say about this audience? They are inexperienced. They're learning a new skill. They are adventurous to a degree. They're a little bit handy or working to become so, and they might be new to certain tools with woodworking. Based on these points alone, some podcast content might include getting over your fears, resources for learning new skills, safety considerations, failures you've had and how you've had to overcome those failures, reviews of tools that you've personally used and are applicable, perhaps the occasional off-topic but related handy project. Maybe something that might inspire somebody who likes woodworking to take on and try another project, like maybe building your own audio rack for your podcast studio. Hmm, I wonder if we know a couple of people that have done that in the past. Now, as you consider your audience, think about the pros and the cons to the different options. And why we say pros and cons is because there are pros and cons for having both a broad audience or a smaller niche audience. Here's a personal example we can share for a broad audience, The Gonna Geek Show. The Gonna Geek Show is a show that covers a variety of geek topics. The pros for this, it enhances our personal enjoyment in the podcast. It's off the charts for the three of us, and we geek out in different ways, so choosing what we talk about is as fun as it's all very passionate to each one of us individually. The audience tends to have some broad opinions, which really opens up the conversation when they submit feedback. Some of the cons, though, it's hard to grow the show. The geek who likes to talk about smart home systems may not like to talk about space. The geek who likes to talk about console gaming may not like to talk about the latest developments in Mac OS. This is why we on the Gonna Geek show went to monthly. We decided that it was too broad of a show to make an active effort to grow, but we enjoyed doing the show. We enjoyed hanging out with each other and we like our audience. 
So this allows us to keep going on a monthly basis. Similarly, let's talk about the idea of a hyper niche audience. We talked about some of the pros already, but some of the more additional cons can be, it can be hard to reach your target audience with any podcast, but now you're trying to crack into a very small segment of people. You likely will get a lot of listeners who come and go quickly as they get confused about a hyper-focused target audience, and you may face similar low ceilings to that of an overly broad topic. So be careful how far you niche down. It could have reverse consequences. So if you're trying to define your audience, one tool that we think is helpful is to sort of create an avatar of your target audience. If you create an avatar, and no, we're not talking about the James Cameron film. Is it James Cameron? I think it is. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> if you're trying to create an avatar, uh, you want to think about who are you envisioning listening to this podcast. And the more specific this avatar in your mind can be is better. But going too specific is going to narrow it down to where you might not be able to find your audience. For example, if you say, I want to create a podcast about Canadian cooking, that is, in my mind, this avatar is this kind of not great looking Canadian wearing a Spider-Man shirt that also happens to talk about podcasts about podcasting. That's pretty niche. I was referring to myself, by the way. Nobody wants that target audience. Uh, you want to think, though, about all the characteristics that you'd want in a listener and start putting them together. SP, I know you have an avatar for the better podcasting audience, right? Well, one example of a better podcasting avatar is a person who loves to hobby podcast, lives anywhere in the world that can have access to podcasting, wants to start their show off on the right foot, and or wants to make their show better, has fun podcasting, and finally, and most importantly, can tolerate both a Canadian and a Minnesotan. So that's an example of an avatar of somebody that you're trying to reach out to. Some are more actionable than others, but it helps define the avatar by choosing some of those things. And once you have the structure for your avatar, you can think of content to create better or where to build relationships with your listeners. More on the building relationships later. For better podcasting, I think the best way that we build our audience is uh, SP usually reaches out to most people individually and apologizes for me. I know it's the American apologizing, but but let's be honest, he, he's got a lot to apologize on my behalf. I try to track down as many listeners as I can and apologize for Steven. Yes, this is true. <laughs> But now that you've determined what your target audience is, how might you make sure that you're doing the right thing to try to reach them? Well, first, assess your current audience. How is your current audience trending? Is your community growing with followers that would fit the definition of your audience or that avatar that you envisioned? Are questions and comments about main topics uh, the focus of the show? Or are they off on a tangent? Also, think about soliciting feedback from people in your target audience that you are hoping would be the type of person to listen to the show. Ideally, as you build your podcast, you're going to come to have some trusted contacts that you can reach out to in that audience space. If you can ask them for some honest feedback and maybe ways that you might better shape the show for their enjoyment, you might be able to appease that audience a little bit more. Perhaps you might need to pay for some branding consultant to give you a bit of an evaluation. Or there's also the idea of throwing it out to a trusted podcast community, maybe like Better Podcasting's Discord channel, or maybe a, a big wide, cast a wide net like the R Podcasting subreddit. If you throw it out there, you might be able to get some feedback from people in the space that you weren't exactly sure, uh, would check out your show to begin with. And if you can define it while you're requesting this feedback, it can also help you get that valuable feedback if you are in a broad scenario. For example, if I went and I tried to put out a show to r slash podcasting and try to see how I was doing to target a certain type of audience, I might disclose that at the beginning. My podcast is about this and I'm trying to reach this type of listener. Are you that type of listener? If so, would you mind listening to my episode and giving me some feedback. So now you're kind of narrowing it down to your target audience. 
And that type of person might listen to it and go, no, I, 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 this doesn't appease to me at all. And I am a Canadian geek who likes to look at Canadian cooking. So this is this is something where if you put that out there, you might find some people in that niche to give you some feedback. But also including where you can find people that were within your target audience. If you can explore outside your niche, you can accomplish some things as well. For example, if you had somebody outside your niche listen to an episode, what would they take away on the focal topic for that episode? Since they're not biased towards your focus niche, they may have a decent unclouded view. In the woodworking example above, if they say to you, it sounds like your woodworking podcast is trying to help beginners like you, they figured it out correctly. However, if they take a listen to the episode and they say, it sounds like you're a tool review podcast, then you're missing the mark. And if they say, it's that paint drying podcast I've always wanted, then you may have a golden opportunity on your hands to create one or pivot your existing project in that direction. So what if you need to make a shift with your show? You first, you need to define what shift you want to make. You take a look at what you're currently doing and the audience you're currently reaching and what changes can you make to be more appealing to the target niche? Who will you lose by making those changes? It's a great question. If your podcast is currently reaching the wrong target audience, then you should be okay with losing some people, but make sure it's the right people. What will the shift do for your personal enjoyment of the podcast? How will you maintain that? And is it the core focus you set out for your podcast? Do you have the same passion by these changes? All great questions, right? Or is it a different shift you want to make? Instead of trying to reach a different target audience, are you enjoying what you're doing now and the type of audience you're reaching? Maybe instead you need to shift your personal desired focus to lean into what you're doing already. And how does that change your plan for the future of your podcast? Is it still sustainable as you would first plan? And is that still going to be fun with you if you pivot to another topic that you didn't plan on, but you're getting an audience for? If that is the case and you want to shift it, do you need to change other branding and other marketing, the intros to your show, et cetera, to align with the new focus of the podcast? I mean, this could include getting whole new social media or at least rebranding your social media accounts. Now, another thing, knowing who your audience is, will help you do is promoting your show. Now, whether you pay for promotion opportunities or you hustle yourself with social media engagement, conference appearances, and or guesting on other similar types of podcasts, knowing your desired audience will help you focus your energy in the right directions. This could even include joining a network of similar-minded shows that might assist in the overall promotion. While in today's climate, you probably won't get an opportunity to promote with your exact specifications, depending on how well you define your avatar, you will get close. For example, your target avatar might be an East Coast suburban married mother of three kids with a sports dog named Porthos and two cats named Spot and Neelix. Her name is Wendy. She's 35 years old and has been married for nine years to Alec. She drives a 2023 Kia Carnival, runs two to uh, three miles a day, and is constantly looking for bargains to feed and clothe her family. Forget targeting with those specifics. You're not going to do it. It's way too specific. However, it is a neat avatar, right? You can target places this type of person would go, such as looking up a family recipe on social media. So that would be Pinterest, Instagram, YouTube, and then you can place ads there, or you can place ads on parenting podcasts through Pocket Cast or Overcast, and maybe sponsor some local PTO meetings. These are all targeted promotional opportunities for your show. And nobody wants to waste money, especially a hobby podcaster that might not have it. You're not talking about an advertising budget in the thousands. You're talking about maybe in the hundreds, right? So knowing who your target, target audience is will help you focus your limited advertising budget if you have one. Even better, if you don't have one, then it helps you focus where you're going to go in your non-paid advertisement and promotion, as I discussed before. 
Of course, since we're talking about defining your podcast, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the idea that there is a potential audience impact by focusing on audio versus focusing on video. And we bring this up because in April of 2023, while we're recording this, the term podcast is very fluid. Some people might have you believe elsewise, but it's the reality. It is a very fluid term to the general mainstream public. And so you need to consider that if there is uh, going to be a target audience of a video podcast, that might have different results than if you are targeting the audio only audience. We've talked about a lot of the differences between focusing on audio and focusing on video in the past. So we won't get into the weeds of it, but we did want to bring up in the context of this conversation that you need to consider that if you're focusing on one of these things, it's going to be to the detriment of the other. For example, if you're going to focus primarily on video, you might find there's a certain disconnect with, with certain things that you discuss for the audio only folks that don't have the video in front of them. Of course, there's also the reverse as well. There could be a certain disconnect with video folks if you're primarily focusing on reaching the audio only listeners. So you want to make sure you're considering which of these you're looking to focus on and know that the other one is probably going to have a bit of a lower ceiling about the maximum potential listeners. And an example of that is that with this show here, we're a talking head podcast. We primarily focus towards the audio side of things, but we do try to, you know, doll up the video side a little bit, but it's not, you know, splashy or super enticing on the video side of things because we're just not going to put that effort into it because we're focusing mostly on the audio side of things. We we do want to put together a good product for the video side of things, but it's not to the extent of what you would see if we were mostly targeting the video audience. And as such, that means that the likelihood of of really growing our video uh, audience is probably lower than the potential on our audio audience. For our show, I would say absolutely. Although there's been a pivot to uh, more and more people wanting to do video with their shows. But primarily when we were putting this together, I was thinking in terms of going out to become successful in another venue, uh, TikTok, uh, Instagram, family, YouTube, whatever. And you are using those just for promotion. And yet you find that you really catch on to one and then you focus on that. So your podcast becomes secondary or you think about even stopping your podcast because you want to focus in a different direction. That's part of that shift that we were talking about earlier. But definitely there is a different audience that you would be targeting between audio and video. And you just have to acknowledge that and move on. Also, audience behavior changes over time as well. There is a persistent growing number of young people that have grown up watching YouTube. So that's where they get their content. Now, whether you have a podcast or a video show or whatever you want to call it on YouTube, if you're listening and you're generally a younger person, you're just going to call it a podcast. So whether or not you distribute it via an RSS feed, audio only and video, I mean, both are adequate and could release a little bit of growth as you go along too. So anyway, yes, it, it is a topic to discuss between audio and video. As we come to a conclusion for this segment, I just want to focus on a few things. First of all, make sure you're having fun with your podcast. And if your audience is not enabling that joy of your podcast, then you might want to focus on a different sort of audience. But if your audience is the right audience, you're just going to have more and more fun because they're going to give you feedback. They're going to tell your friends, you're going to grow, and you're just going to be focused and make better content for them overall. So defining your audience and knowing who your audience is, is almost as important as the topic, but not quite. So we had some relevant feedback to do with the idea of defining your audience that we wanted to run down right now. I had gone and I had asked, question for tonight, how would you define your target audience for your podcast? And yes, I had posted this in our Discord server just today. And we had had Anthony, and I think that's how you say it, say Anthony from Capes on the Couch podcast say, I actually literally just had this conversation with my co-host last night. 
it was part of a larger branding conversation about the show. One of the things we discussed was our ideal listener and determining the purpose of our show. We talked what problem our show solves, how we want our listeners to feel after listening, and how to increase our our reach to find those people who would be ideal fans but haven't heard of us yet. This is exactly the type of thing that we're talking about when you're defining your audience because Anthony's picturing who they want to reach and the sort of things that that they can do to try to reach that person. That worked very, very well. I wonder if SP has been leaking you spoilers about what we're going to be discussing. <laughs> no, not quite, but <laughs> I know that Anthony and Doc Issues have done a lot of deliberate things with their podcast. They're two very intelligent people and they know the audience that they're trying to market to and trying to help, quite frankly. So in doing that, they make deliberate decisions with their show. So bravo, Anthony, bravo. Damien, the DM, also gave us some feedback and he said, people that are interested in fantasy stories that have no planned end and whose fate is at least semi-randomly determined by randomness. With a healthy dose of sound design on the back end to help tell that story immersively. So that's actually a good definitive thing to have in an audience because this is the content that you're creating. So your audience should definitely know how to do that. And Stephen, we had one last one as well. We did. We had Waffles from Play Comics say, people who like comics and the video games about them, people who want to learn about the comic a way that doesn't involve reading 50 plus years of stuff. Oh, that is such a problem with comics. <laughs> it's not just a problem with comics. There's several things in the history of humanity that that's a problem with, but it's definitely a problem with comics because there's just been so much that has been produced since the start of comics, like in the 20s, basically, we'll just say that in the 1920s. So it's 100 years of this stuff. And there is lore left, right and backwards. It's got to be so difficult. I had a very brief stint with a Marvel comic podcast, a podcast dedicated to Marvel po uh, comics. Stephen, you had a larger stint with even more. So that's definitely something that you know well, that this is a difficult topic to tackle that will interest even the average comic book fan. And you've got the whole Marvel DC thing as well. And that can shift on a dime as well, because... Um... Sometimes these publishers like to make massive changes in everything and now they lose a whole bunch of their audience. And now you, the people who were enjoying your show before might not like the show that uh, you're doing now. Yeah, we've talked kind of some geeky stuff. We talked about Star Trek and Star Wars. We're talking about comics here. It doesn't have to be. It no. could be something as simple as car manufacturers. Like that's simple. You could have <laughs> a GMC fan, a Chevy fan, which believe it or not, I think there's a difference between the two. In terms of the fandom, you can have a Ford fan, you can have a Tesla fan, and you know, they all get together and a Dodge fan, they, they all really like their stuff, but and, and they fight for it. But in general, like if you're a truck guy, you like all trucks, but you like your truck the best, right? If you have a Chevy truck, it's, it's the best truck. If you have a Dodge truck, it's the best truck, or at least the best truck that you can afford, sort of thing. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be geeky stuff. It could, heck, it, we talk about quilting and sewing too, right? It could be different sewing machine manufacturers, right? So you do have camps and you just want to be cognizant of them. If your fandom includes all sorts of like sewing, I don't think you're going to get in a camp of, of a Viking sewing machine versus a singer sewing machine, but I guess it's possible. In cars, it, generally, you might have some banting back and forth, but if you're talking all trucks, I think you can get into that. Uh, if, if you have a hyper niche topic though, like we were talking about with the comics or with the star Wars versus star Trek, it can get a little bit contentious. So just be cognizant of that as you're going forward with the show, trying to cater to your audience. So I'd like to know, how do you define your audience? Uh, have you ever done an audience shift? Do you have an avatar in your mind about what your ideal listener is get in touch with us for any of the ways you can find all the contact at betterpodcasting.com forward slash contact 
You can come to our Discord at betterpodcasting.com forward slash Discord. Or you can go and you can create a podcast that is hyper niche to SPNI to tell us your feedback. This is the Better Podcasting Download. It's been 10 weeks or so since we last did a Better Podcasting Download. We're going to talk about one specific topic, but I just wanted to give the list of other things that have been going on in the past few weeks that we've covered on Better Podcasting Live Chat. If you want more information, you can delve back into those episodes. There was a lot of testing that we did in our last 10 or so episodes of Better Podcasting Live Chat. We tested a lot of microphones. We tested ChatGPT. Steven was doing some initial testing with the OBS vertical video streaming. We did some studio updates. Steven added additional monitors, bigger monitors more resolution in the monitors. I actually accomplished, I know we talked about it in the last episode, but I actually RMA'd my Rodecaster Pro 2. And that saga continues. We'll talk about that later, not today. In news of the podcast industry, Lipson finally gave a financial update. There's still some uncertainty there, but they gave an update. Hindenburg Pro version 2 came out. Google Podcast indexing changes. StreamYard now has beta local recorded tracks. I think they're getting close to bringing out a beta. Anchor is now called Spotify for podcasters. There's some change behind there. The big one, I think, in all these is YouTube finally embraced podcasts. I think that change is both underwhelming right now and ongoing. So who knows what it'll end up being. Apple Podcasts came out with channels, again, something that we asked for 10, 15 years ago. And of course, Stephen did the stuff with OBS Vertical Video. So if you want information on any of that, go into the last few episodes of Better Podcasting live chat. This week, Riverside decided to roll out its new changes. There are a complete all-in-one solution You can record, you can edit, you can share conversations. There is now transcription involved. You can edit via the transcription. So it's looking more and more like Descript, which also came out with an update. But in Riverside, here's my take on it. They have a lot of new features that they've thrown into this new Riverside. And I think they have to, to keep tabs on what's going on. Riverside.fm was traditionally a place where you could connect, you could pay to connect with somebody via video and audio, and then you could record that. And then you could take those recordings and edit it later. Kind of like clean feed, stream yard, the squad cast, that sort of stuff. Well, now they've added more into their functionality. They have the transcription. You can record and then edit via the uh, transcript or by the words instead of by the waveforms. I have not tried any of this. So here are my considerations on Riverside. Does it work without any hiccups? Does it lose recording? Does it keep all the tracks in sync? This is a particularly keen insight into Riverside because in the podcasting space, I've noticed many, many people over the last few years that have complained about this has gone wrong with Riverside. Like I was using Riverside and it didn't work. Now, I don't know if it's the software itself, the connection, maybe the hardware that people are using, but I see this more and more and more. And I just wonder if maybe, and this is just me spitballing, this is my opinion, and I'd have to talk to Riverside to at least even bring this up with them. But are they asking too much for a common level of podcast machine, or do you have to have a higher level of machine and internet connection for all this to work? I don't know. Another consideration I would have with this sort of thing for a hobby podcaster is don't make it too expensive. Yes, I would expect to pay a little as we go along, but if you make it too expensive, then the average hobby podcaster is going to be like, look, I can't do this. I can't pay $50 a month for this whatever it is. So for anybody that's involved in Riverside or uh, like considerations, software, clouds uh, capability, 
if it's too expensive, hobbyists are not going to be able to make it. And they'll go through other solutions like we have with the DIY solution of using video, VDO Ninja. I keep saying that fast and it sounds like video or video. It's VDO.ninja and then OBS or XSplit or whatever. And then the last thing is it working fast enough to meet a podcaster's timeline. If you're doing a TV review show, the optimum timeline is you watch the show the day it comes out, you podcast that night, you get it out that night so people can have it in their feeds the next morning. Full disclosure, I have virtually never done this with any <laughs> of my TV review shows, whether it's Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., Starling Tribune, the one I'm guesting on right now, Strange New Worlds. It's always a couple of days in order to get that. So do we hit that first wave? No, we don't. But it, it's a more longer term discussion. And we try to create a relationship with the audience long term so that they want to wait to listen to our show in order to then carry on with the next one. So meeting a podcaster's timeline, if it's too slow uploading or downloading or rendering the things online, it's not going to work for podcasters in general. So those are some of my considerations of using something like Riverside. It's probably not all inclusive, but just off the top of my head, when this news came out, this is what I was thinking of. Stephen, what do you think about this move that Riverside and others are making? Uh, I'm always a little hesitant when I see a shift like this. And the reason I'm hesitant is I'll, I'll kind of start with how they're branding this post is they start by or billing it. They start by saying, meet the new Riverside. So so those phrase, that phrase in itself tells me they're trying to make a shift on what people see them as because it, they're calling it the new Riverside. And, and that means that there is a certain amount of um, change in focus if it's to the extent that they're calling it the new something. That's just the way that it is. And and the post goes on to support that by talking about a bunch of different features that are coming in there. Well, why I have a little concern on it is because you can almost infer that the old model wasn't working um, for maybe it wasn't sustainable long term. Maybe it wasn't reaching the audience or the um, subscription level they wanted, the uh, customer base that they wanted. So there's there's some reason that they're making such a large shift. If your current model's working and you're endlessly collecting users and and you know it, it's a profitable business, you don't really need to invest all this time and effort into making something new because obviously your model's working. So the fact that they feel it necessary to to make this big shift tells me that there's something behind the scenes that they want to target something else and and I don't know what that is. Well, if that is inferring that they need to start making more money, these are a lot of features to be adding in. And, and we've seen these sort of things come up elsewhere before, and, and they're a, a little expensive to manage, and they come with some, some downsides and some technical issues as well. And so I, I wonder what this means and, and what they're going to do to make sure that they're, they're able to grow their audience in the manner that they can keep affording to, to keep this product in a stable manner or they can um, make sure that it's not fallen off the tracks by throwing a whole bunch of new features in and not being able to support it. So I'm curious to see that side of things just because of those reasons. It, it seems to me that that there's a reason they're trying to shift their focus. And I, I hope that this will bring in the money that they need to be able to keep or start offering a good product. I say start because of the stories you mentioned earlier. One thing I will say in Riverside's favor right now is if you didn't know, disclosure, I'm a moderator on the r slash podcasting subreddit, and I've seen a team Riverside account. It's probably controlled by more than one person, but I've seen the account engage on a lot of people. So if somebody has a Riverside issue, that team will come up with a post and say, hey, we'd like to know more about your issue. Have you send us an email or if you contacted support or something like that. Really, I think that's the right thing to do. If you go on social media and you're asking for help on an issue that you're having with a capability, especially if it's during their working hours for their customer service desk, it's probably ill-advised. Now, I could see like on the weekend or during a holiday or something, you're having an issue to like, can anybody help me? I could kind of see that. But during the day, you should probably reach out to them. And 
these companies know that. So hats off to Riverside for being at least on Reddit with that capability of being able to handle issues as they come up at least or funnel issues to the right people that can help work them. I don't know if they're doing the same thing on other social media platforms. I could just say that they're on Reddit, which is a main hub for podcasters at least reaching out. So good on them there. Other than that, I do have concerns over anybody that's rolling out something new like Hindenburg version two rolled out. And I know that Damien had been using it and he ran into some issues. There were some things that were good about it, but he was running into some issues with that as well. I think anything these days uh, that's being rolled out will uh, roll out with the, the video game mentality of let's just get it out there and let's fix the bugs once it gets out there. They don't really do a proper alpha beta test or, or, or whatever that's called when you're testing and, and verifying software. So and in some cases, you just don't think of the use cases. So it's like, okay, we have this capability. What are you going to use it for? And you get it out there and people start using it in ways that you have no idea what's going on, right? So in, in any way, I do like the fact that capabilities are progressing. I worried that they're being priced out for hobbyists and that hobbyists will have to revert to uh, lesser tools just because they can't afford it. I mean, there's higher level hobbyists that... You might be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, and they'll be able to afford the the great new things. Heck, I'm a rocket scientist. So I, yes, I have a little bit of disposable income. I choose to throw the disposable income into podcasting. But I realize not everybody does. You hear a lot about like high school or college kids that are trying to podcast. And I, I don't think they'll be able to afford this sort of stuff moving forward. We do stream our show when we record live, usually on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern for now. Uh, and today we might be recording and streaming on a different day. But we do have in our chat Liberty Dude, who actually brings up a, a good question. He says, I think the question has to be, why would someone use this service versus others available? And I think that that's, you know, with, with this scatter of services that seem to be available for this type of thing, and it just continues to grow. I think that that's always going to be a very relevant question. Yeah. So we'll see how Riverside performs long term. I always keep my eye on the posts over on the podcasting subreddit. I keep my eyes on our Discord server because people come in and ask us on our Discord server as well. So we'll see how this goes long term. This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. I love our Better Pod Back segment. I love it for many reasons. Primarily, I love our audience. I love that our audience always contributes some fun things to do with podcast discussions. I also love the fact that we call it Better Pod Back. It's fun. Uh, we started out with a question that I had put out there. Actually, SP put out there. It, it was me. Uh, we put it out there together. Yeah. Together. It was a joint effort. Uh, what did. what changes work development have you done for your podcast over the last two months? What did Damien say, SP? Damien, the DM, said the first two episodes of the year came out in the last two months. Also started to backfill old blog content that has evergreen value into the new website so I can finally dump Squarespace. On the more fun production side of things, we can't get together to record again until later this month. So I've been spending some free time without anything to edit, working with some sound design tools. I don't have any examples with me to share right now, but I've been figuring out more about how Reformer Pro by Krotos, K-R-O-T-O-S, works and how to work my own sample library into it. It's going to be some work to get the samples usable with Reformer, but so far, I've been able to get some parchment writing segments done, and it's so much easier than what I've done in the past with manually dragging in each sample and blending them myself. Damien, sounds like you've done a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do <laughs> during our hiatus. So kudos on you for taking advantage of the production time. Oh, that's why you didn't do your podcast that was a life in the day, a day in the life of Stephen John Drew. That's why. Yeah, th there's an audience of like three people for that show. I was just looking for the sound design. What sort of Canadian sounds do you think would be in that? Uh, some that are royalty free. <laughs> Lots of uh, uh, pancake flipping. 
Uh, also, we had had uh, a comment come our way from Kent. We at, hey, I like, okay, it's just in charge and I'm mentoring, but okay. Want to go ahead and add it to YouTube as a static image with audio thing, but just discovered that old go-to Windows Movie Maker isn't free anymore. WTF. So what free products out there does everyone recommend? And Damien, the DM, came back and he said, DaVinci Resolve is free. It's way more than you need, but since what you need is super basic, you should be able to manage. And Stephen, you've had some experience with DaVinci Resolve. Could you double down on what Damien said? I, I would. The only thing is, I think they're very different products. And if someone's using Windows Movie Maker, it may be a little overwhelming going to DaVinci Resolve. You know, and, and why I say that is, it's very much in line with many other more advanced video editors where there's a whole timeline, but there's more features than just that. Like if you were to export the file, you got a whole bunch of different settings in there as far as exporting goes. Movie Maker, that type of audience, uh, that type of user, it's a lot more simplified. So there'd be a bit of a learning curve, but it's also free. So, hey, why not? We also had some comments on my beard. What? Your beard? What happened to your beard? Yeah. Yeah, well, I shaved it off two days ago. So Waffle said, I'm also not happy with it. Now I look older than SP and that's not cool. And full disclosure, I do a show with Waffles. It's the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. So we're both on screen together and he doesn't want to look older than me, which <laughs> there's like 20 or 25 years between us. So yeah, I can, if I was younger than me, I wouldn't want to look older than me. So anyway, SP's Murder Beard, which is Jason from the Smoking and Drinking in Space podcast said, we are all protesting my removal. And then Johnny P said, Stephen, I see a lot of videos that add different hairstyles, big teeth, et cetera, to one's face. Can you recommend software so I can add a beard to SP's clean shaven face? So it'll shock, ease the shock of that for me. And Stephen's just using the, the crop and move to remove my lower face from the video right now. So go check that out at betterpodcasting.com. Uh, the video will be on the link for this show at betterpodcasting.com slash 273. Johnny, maybe one day I'll implement some real life effects. There's got to be something we can do to give him a, give him a sure. beard. We miss sure it. There is. But it's got, it can't be a, fit, but what, you know, any old beard, it's got to be a version of his beard. Like we've got enough source material that I'm sure we can do some form of deep fake. You two are going <laughs> to conspire for the next two months to find something by the end of season three of better podcasting. I just know it. Uh, so if you got something you want to say about podcasting, please do get in touch with us through any of the ways you can go to betterpodcasting.com forward slash contact. We do have a bunch of different methods, but we love our discord D uh, betterpodcasting.com forward slash discord. Lots of awesome people there. And hey, we finally enticed after many years, Johnny Pennington to join the fray. Yeah, I'm looking forward to his podcast, though. He's getting closer. And the reason I know this is because he was one of the people that I was talking about that self-constructed an audio rack. So he, he is moving forward. He did. All right, that's going to go ahead and wrap it up. But before we go, I just want to mention a couple quick things. Uh, number one, you should check out the Gunna Geek Network, GunnaGeek.com. Lots of awesome podcasts over there. Second, SP is doing... How many podcasts right now, SP? I'm doing four every week and then five with the occasional Gonna Geek show, but that's only going to last another couple of weeks. The fifth and final show I am actually doing as a favor for some friends. I was brought in to guest and produce, guest produce, really, the Strange New Worlds fan cast talking about Picard season three. It's helping out a friend recover from a stroke, and it's also helping the other friend they're married from producing the show because he's got to devote more time to their kids. So it checks a lot of boxes and I am just happy. I'm ecstatic actually, because I've been watching Trek since the original series was on TV way back when sixties and early seventies. And I get to see the end of Star Trek, the next generation. This is really fun. The next three weeks are going to be really fun for me. So I'm happy I'm doing it, but, but doing five shows a week, there's three over the limit and possibly four over the limit. And I will say that 
I'm only doing it because it's a limited engagement. I'm helping out some friends and I've got some great help on my other shows like Steven with better podcasting. Do you say good help? Because I, I would I would say it, mediocre at well, best help for me. Can, Canadian help. <laughs> uh, if you ha- want to check out the podcast that SP is doing about Star Trek, you should. It is the... Say it. Strange New Worlds fan cast. I didn't. I couldn't remember if it was fan cast or podcast. That's why I threw it over to you. I couldn't remember which word it is. I'll confess it right now. The Strange New Worlds fan cast. And that implies, by the way, that usually the podcast is about the Strange New Worlds Star Trek television show uh, when SP is not on it. And that is one of the, the Trek shows that are out there. And the reason I bring up Trek right now is because we have had a lot of discussion uh, about this show that SP, this TV show that SP has been podcasting about in our Discord server. Uh, that's we got a whole bunch of different channels in there. Yes, there's podcasting talk, but there's other stuff like sci-fi talk and Star Trek talk and tech talk and smart home talk and a bunch of other random things. So we'd love to have you in the Discord server because we have a bunch of different topics that hopefully will scratch your itch. Maybe SP will create a uh, Ford Lovers pod uh, channel. No. No, I will never do that. <laughs> Have I never told my Ford pickup problem on this, my experience with the Ford trucks in the in this show? Y- you did, and you're going to recap it in our Discord server at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. <sighs> yeah, come and hear all about my experience with Ford pickup trucks. Yeah. So we just lost some people for episode number 273 of Better Podcasting. I'm Stephen John Drew saying we're back. Looking forward to talking about your audience this season. And I'm looking forward to talking about the rest of season three. Keep tuned to Better Podcasting. We'll see everybody later. Bye. Pour one out for the beard. Bye. Thanks for checking out another episode of Better Podcasting. You can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week.